Hey everyone, today I want to focus on this problem right here. And the thing I love about this problem is that it really illuminates a big piece of what it's like to be a practicing mathematician. See, for me, problem solving is not about getting to an answer or a solution. It's really about looking at the problem at hand from many different perspectives to really get a deep understanding of what's going on with the objects at play. So the problem here is you have a square and then you have three equally length line segments that stick right inside of the square as shown in the figure. And it turns out the one on the left and the one on the right that look parallel actually are parallel. And your goal is to find the minimum possible angle that PD can make with AD. So this particular problem has many different solutions and we'll present two that are really, really different and illuminate different aspects of what's actually going on in the picture. So let's dive in and see the multiple ways that we can view this particular problem. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar. And today we're interested in this question where we have a square ABCD and then these three sticks, PD, PQ, and QB that are all of the same length. And we're also given that PD and QB are parallel. And the question is, what's the minimum possible value of this angle right here, uh, PDA? Um, so in order to go about this problem, in our first solution, what we'll do is think about placing this in the plane with coordinates and seeing what possibilities there are for where this point P lies. So I'm going to let this P be a generic point, so let's call it AB. And since this square is in the plane and this picture when scaled looks the same in terms of all the angles involved, we can make this be an arbitrary point. I'll pick the point 1, 1. Arbitrary as long as the two coordinates are the same. Alright, so now given that, the slope from P to D is the same as the slope from B, B to Q because these two sides are parallel or these two line segments are parallel. At the same time, they have the same length. So it should be the case that the difference in the coordinates, I'll make D the origin, the difference in the X coordinates of these two points should be the same as the difference in these two points. And the difference in the Y coordinates should also be the same here as well. Um, okay, so the difference here is a minus zero. The difference here is one minus whatever this is. So sh this should be one minus a, uh, because one minus the quantity one minus a is a, which is the difference in the x coordinates between p and d. And by a similar thought, uh, the y coordinate here should be one minus b. Now we're also given that p d actually equals uh, PQ. And so now that gives us a constraint on A and B given that these two lengths are equal. Let's write down the equation involving um, these two expressions. So the length of this side is the sum of the squares of its coordinate and then the square root of that. So that's the square root of A squared plus B squared. And then here we'll have the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences, right? To find the length of PQ, we take this minus this, square this minus the square, add and take the square root. Um, so here we'll get A minus, one minus A, actually I'll do it the other way. So one minus A minus A, which gives us one minus two A squared. And then in the other coordinate, we'll have one minus two B squared. Okay, so let's expand this. If you look at this expression, it looks like it's about to move toward the expression of some type of conic, like an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbola or a circle. And the reason we get that idea is because we have two variables and it's quadratic. Um, so what we'll do is look at all the um, terms here that have the same variables, clump them together, and complete the square and see what we get. So we'll have these two and these two. I'll start with the, the A one. Okay, 
Um, so if we take all of these constants, move them over and divide by three, uh, here we get two minus eight thirds, which is two thirds. That goes over here, or as a minus two thirds, so you get a two thirds over here and divided by that three is a two ninths. And then we're left with a minus two thirds squared plus b minus two thirds squared. Okay, so what does that tell us? Um, that tells us that the point AB in this picture, the point P, must satisfy this equation here, which actually means then that it lies on a circle whose radius squared is this quantity right here and whose center is given by these coordinates if we think about that circle being plotted in the AB plane. Okay, um, so let's take a look at this circle and analyze this point P with respect to being on the circle in order to try to minimize this angle theta. All right, so the point P lies on this circle right here in the plane whose coordinates are given by um, A and B. So I've drawn a prototypical drawing of this circle where the center is this point two thirds, two thirds. And now the question is among all these points that lie on this circle, what's the minimum angle we can make with the y-axis? That's where theta lies, that angle right over there. Um, okay, so we see that the angle gets smaller and smaller as we go across the circle. And the smallest it can possibly be is when it just touches the circle at the end right here. Or in other words, when P is tangent to this circle at this point right over here. And that'll minimize this value theta right over here. Okay, so the question is, what is this angle theta when we're tangent? All right, so a few observations. First of all, there's this theorem in geometry that tells us that if you have a point here and a tangent to that point on the circle, then it has to be perpendicular to the radius. So if I draw the radius in, I'll have a right angle right over here. Okay, furthermore, we actually know the length of this side right over here because it's the square root of this number, it's the radius of our circle. The square root of this is the square root of two divided by three. So that is what the radius is of the circle and hence the side length right over here. We also know this length right over here, which is the hypotenuse of this triangle formed by the origin, P, and the center of the circle. Um, because the coordinates of this point are two thirds, two thirds, and this starts at the origin, the length is the square root of the sum of the squares of these components. Okay, the sum of the squares here, we get four ninths and four ninths for a total of eight ninths. And so the length is the square root of eight ninths, or in other words, two root two over three. Okay, so, in this triangle then, we can find out what this angle here is, which will tell us what theta is because this entire angle here, because this is lying on the line y equals x, it cuts this quadrant right in half. This angle is 45 degrees, right? And so theta is 45 degrees minus this alpha, and alpha we can compute using this triangle. Right, in particular, the sine of alpha is uh, root 2 over 3 divided by twice root 2 over 3, and that's a half. And so alpha is 30 degrees. Right, and consequently, theta then is 15 degrees. Okay, cool. So a way to approach this problem that places it in the plane, and then works with the situation at hand in order to figure out this minimum possible angle. Now, one thing you should be careful of is you should actually make sure to figure out where this point is to ensure that it actually lies inside of the square with side lengths one, right? Otherwise, it's like it's possible, we haven't actually um, figured this out, but it's possible that because of the radius of the circle, the square cuts off 
in something like this. It turns out that it doesn't, but I'll leave you um, to try to figure out why that's the case. Okay, so that's the first solution presented from the perspective of trying to figure out where this point P lies. And we get some geometric intuition as to where it does is on um, this circle right over here. And that helps us to do the minimization we're interested in. If you like this part of the video so far, click like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more things like this. And now we'll move on to the second solution, which uses a completely different approach. Our next solution to the problem is going to be geometric. So here's our theta that we're trying to minimize. Um, and we're going to look at symmetry in the situation. So we have these two side lengths being equal and these two being parallel. Um, so we notice already that there's some kind of symmetry going on about this square. We have a nice square and then these two side lengths that are sort of doing the same thing. Because they're parallel, in fact, this angle is theta. That means that this angle here has to be theta as well. You see these two parallel lines and then something cutting them. Okay, so what I'm going to do is exploit the symmetry and think about the balance that's happening already between these two by drawing in the diagonal BD. Okay, so now that we've done that, we can actually see a little bit more symmetry that's happening. Um, so first of all, because these two are parallel, we actually have other angles that are equal. For example, um, this angle and this angle have to be equal because we have two parallel line segments with a transversal. So I'll just label that like this. Right, and then we also have that this angle from the diagonal all the way out to this side length is 45 degrees. So here, this thing here is 45 minus theta. And the same thing happens here. This angle here is 45 minus theta. Uh, okay, so if we look at these triangles now, we have the stapled side length here with two angles subtending it that are the same. Right, so we have this angle side angle relationship going on between these triangles um, and as a consequence, the triangles are actually congruent. Let me label this point here, maybe R. And so the triangles that are congruent are PDR. And QBR. So let's use that to try to figure out something a little bit more about the situation. Okay, like we did in the first solution, we labeled this angle here alpha, I'll do that. So we'll let alpha be 45 minus theta, right? So if you wanna minimize theta, we should maximize alpha. All right, so since PDR and QBR are congruent, PR and QR have the same length, which is gonna be half the side length of PD. Um, so let's say this PR has length X, then that means that uh, PD has length 2X. We could normalize things and make this one and make this two um, in a general setting, but I might as well just use the variable, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, so let's analyze what's going on with um, this triangle PDR for a second. Our goal is to maximize this angle right over here. Now the only information we have with respect to this triangle is this, a little bit about this unknown angle and then these two side lengths. So if we're trying to get a relationship somehow, we should relate it to this angle right over here. Let's call that beta um, because we can at least use like the sine law to relate these two. So the sine of this angle, which is alpha, divided by this side length x is equal to the sine of beta over 2x by the sine law. And so if we <clears throat> rearrange this expression, that tells us that the sine of alpha is the sine of beta divided by two. Alpha here, again, is between zero and 45 degrees. Um, so if you look at the graph of the function sine of x in that region, it kind of goes like this. 
So sine of alpha will increase as alpha increases, right? So if we're trying to maximize alpha, now we have an expression for sine of alpha. Maximizing alpha will happen at the same time we maximize the sine of alpha because again, sine of alpha is an increasing function between zero and 45 degrees. This is usually labeled pi over four radians in the actual um, graph. But if you want to maximize um, sine of alpha by this expression, that would be the same as maximizing the sine of beta. Now, the sine of any angle is at most one. So the maximum possible thing the sine of beta could even possibly be is one. And we can actually make that happen by making beta a right angle. So if we make beta 40, uh, 90 degrees, right, we have a right angle here, then that gives us this theta or this alpha value satisfying the sine of alpha is a half, which is an upper bound of what sine of alpha can be. And we've actually achieved it by setting beta to 90 degrees. And so this is the maximum possible value sine of alpha could ever even hope of being. And since again, sine of alpha is increasing as alpha goes from zero to 45 degrees, that means this maximizes alpha, which in turn minimizes theta. Okay, if sine of alpha is a half, as we see over here, this means alpha is 30 degrees, which then tells us that theta is 15 degrees just like we had in our first solution. So this is a cool way to go about the problem that really exploits the symmetry of the situation together with some information that we have that's purely geometric and a little bit about maximizing the angle, knowing a little bit about the relationships in the triangle that we're given. Now I should mention there are other solutions to this problem, some that are much more trigonometric. They kind of follow similar ideas that happened in our proof using the fact that P has to lie on a specific circle, um, but they illuminate some interesting properties of the situation. So I think, again, the point of me presenting this problem and its two solutions is to hone in the fact that in mathematics, we typically like to look at things from multiple perspectives, not just thinking about a problem in order to solve it, but thinking about a problem as a lens to which to see what's actually going on with the situation at hand. And we got a sense both from this geometric point of view and earlier from the point of view of thinking about where P lies as it moves around space. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.